Hi, I'm Justine Gardner, and I'm going to be reading Nature Will Provide from Telephone Me Now. Please, God, let him telephone me now. Please, please. Abigail stares at the phone, an old-fashioned rotary dial, its cord thick and frayed. Your server weighs more than three iPhones combined. Still, it works. There was a dial tone when she picked it up. There was the clickety click click as numbers were dialed painstakingly. He didn't answer the phone. No one did. She got his voicemail. At least she thinks it's his voicemail. The automated voice telling her to leave a message for his mailbox. Did there used to be a greeting? She can't remember. She left the message telling him to call, that she is where she is supposed to be. And now she waits in this tiny cabin. Whose idea was this? His idea, all of this. I hope he's right, she thinks. And then, wait, do I? She shifts in the wooden chair, pushing it back, and it creaks beneath her. In front of her is the telephone table, supporting the ancient piece of black bacolite, a phone book, last issued 2008, and a yellow pad, a pencil, on a small piece of laminated cardboard Welcome to Shady Woods Cabins. We hope you enjoy your stay. If at any time you need help, please call the management office. Remember, always extinguish all fires, both indoors or out. Smokey thanks you. Beneath that, someone had drawn a fair representation of a bear in a ranger's hat. She wonders where the other cabins are located. On the drive, she hadn't seen a single structure or person, just miles and miles of woods down the end of a slim dirt road. Her shoulders still ache from clenching the wheel as the little rental hits stump, stone, and hole over and over. Seriously, whose idea was this? She turns from the telephone table and gets up, stretching her arms above her head. The ceiling is so low she can nearly skim it with her fingertips, and she is not tall. She lowers her arms and fluffs her hair, lifting to allow cool air at her neck. The one-room cabin has not been used much in recent years. She expected this. He had told her as much when they made the plans. A brother's cousin's uncle told him about it or something. Abandoned, useful to hunters, occasional hikers on the trail. Don't worry, he'd said. No one's going to come and yell at us, especially when... She walks into the kitchen, noticing the dust feathering from the hanging skilling pot. There is no refrigerator, only a large belted cooler. She studies it, wonders what might be inside, she turns away. No stove, just a two burner hot plate. No sink, instead a hand pump and no bathroom. She's been avoiding it, avoiding thinking about it. But now that she's here, finally, she knows she has to make some adjustments. There is an outhouse. He told her about it. And even if he hadn't, she saw it when she pulled into the weed choke driveway. An outhouse. She steps out the side door onto the thin porch. It feels surprisingly sturdy under the heel of her boot. There's a rocking chair in one corner, faded and sun-bleached. It looks like one strong breeze would blow it to kindling. A rattling above. She looks up. Tufted in the rafters is a nest. Inside it, something peeps and scrambles. She is sitting in the car, engine idling, charging her phone. She wasn't supposed to keep it with her, according to the plan, but in the rush, you guess if she forgot. She guesses, but she knows she didn't, not really. But there is no signal. She knew there wouldn't be. He'd warned her, but still, she figures it won't hurt to check again, now and then, until the car is out of gas anyway. The phone turns on, searches, 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 nothing. She is off the grid. She is alone. Whose idea was this? She sits in the rocking chair, slowly tilting back and forth, watching a line of ants moving down the porch railing. She counts them, one, two, three. It's been a week, one week, and he hasn't called. Hasn't fucking called. One week, and she hasn't seen anyone, heard anyone. She rocks, thinking. So far, there's enough food. That, at least, has gone according to plan. Nothing exciting, but she could do worse than canned beans, tomato soup. She'll be all right for another few weeks, even without skimping. The well water is cold, pure and sweet. She's not sure. 
she ever tasted water like that back home. She'll live for a time. She's managed the outhouse. There is even a small supply of toilet paper. This, she thinks, will be the first thing to go. A leaf blows past her foot, brushing against the column of ants, and she smiles. Yes, well, nature will provide. She laughs loud. Still, it's August. Fall is creeping in at night. She can feel it now, even though the afternoon sun is high and bright. There, at the breeze's edge. Autumn. After that, it's winter. What then? She thinks of the gun. It was the first thing she looked for that second day after a restless, dreamless night on the musky cot. She knew there'd be one. They'd planned for it, but she wanted to be sure. If he was going to take a long time coming, she needed to know where it was and how to use it. For dinner that night, she has rabbit stew. She still has a few weeks of canned goods, but she figured when she saw the fat rabbit sitting blindly on the hood of her car that she might as well test her hand at hunting. Turns out she is a surprisingly good shot. In the mornings now, after she wakes, eats water for her tea, an endless supply it seems, she sits by the black corded phone and marks the day on the faded memo pad. Like a prisoner in the oubliette, she scratches a line, counts them out, except her sentence is a determinate, her time in the hole without end. Still, it helps to keep track. It's been, by her accounting, 34 days. It's mid-September or thereabouts. The nights come cooler and quicker now. Her supply of firewood is alarmingly low. There is an ax. There are trees. She supposes she will learn to make do. After the accounting, she picks up the heavy receiver and slowly dials the number. Clickety, click, click. She listens to the computer voice, tell her to leave a message. Sometimes she does. Usually she does not. And then she drinks her tea. The snow falls in wide, fat flakes like the ashes of burnt paper. She stands at the window, watching, mesmerized. She thinks it might be Christmas. She isn't sure precisely, but it is near enough. She lowers her head and prays thanks to the infant Jesus. Two things. One, the phone is dead. Not her phone, his. When she calls this morning, there's no automated answer. Just a click and static. It's the first change aside from the seasons. Two, she has run out of matches. The fire, always banked or roaring depending on time of day, must now never be allowed to go out. She looks at the pad. It is nearing March, spring. When the snow clears, she is going to drive the car back down the road until the gas runs out. And then she will walk. She will walk and walk and walk until she finds something, anything. She cannot stay here. June, or close to it, the skies are blue, the sun shines. She found a patch of wild strawberries in a small glade. She pet a fawn as it lay curled in the grass, waiting its mother. She stole tiny eggs from a bird's nest and cracked them into her mouth. She sleeps outside most nights now. She wears no, not, wears few clothes. Why bother? There is no one. There is nothing. This is her world, and she is free. The phone rings. At first, the sound is so loud, so discordant, she thinks she is hallucinating again. Like she first thought she heard the frogs talking about her, when in reality, they were talking to her. Or the crows and their loud secrets. Bring! Bring! causes the tiny, ta tiny table to tremble with the force of its bell. She stares at it, mesmerized, her heart beating hard against her ribs. She realizes what she is supposed to do. Answer it, in some distant part of her brain, but it feels far off, removed. Answer it, answer it, answer it, answer it. She steps closer. Bring! 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 She reaches a tentative hand toward it, retreats. Answer it, answer it, answer it, answer it, answer it. She flees out the back door and runs and runs and runs. She is completely naked, her hair all of it wild and thick like a mountain lamb unshorn. Around her crown, she has made a garland of wildflowers, thorns, a pine cone, a rabbit bone. It rattles as she walks through the woods, rifle on her shoulder. The phone has not rung again. Instead, it is in pieces in the stream, smashed to bits and left to assimilate back into the real world. She walks. She has mapped these woods in her mind. She can circle around and back without getting lost, always finding the cabin, her glade. She also found one other cabin, abandoned, half caved in, a tree growing up its middle. Inside, through one of the black window holes, she saw the outline, the shape of a telephone. 
The air is growing cooler again, slightly. She can smell it in the air as she sits on the porch down across her lap. And then a droning, a hum. From down the road, is it? What is? She stands, readies the gun at her shoulder. A car rolls into view. It is moving slowly, purposefully. It stops abruptly in front of her cabin. The door opens. A man practically falls out. He is thin. His face is gutted with loss. Abigail, he cries out. She cocks the gun. Fires. The ants continue to march down the porch railing. She watches them, rocks in her chair, and counts. Five, ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty-five, thirty, thirty.